Um, well, okay. Tom's Scoins, welcome to the COVID 19 questions as hosted by <laughs> yours truly. Um, very exciting. Yeah, you, we, we, we postponed the call just briefly so that you could make a quick run to the grocery store. Although you just said you made a massive run to the grocery store. That yeah, was not a quick one. Yeah, yeah. Well, give me, give me, because I have a rough idea of the geography of Girona, having lived there for five years. You're in Girona, correct? Yep. Okay. Where are you living? Are you up on some hill where you have to like cart everything two miles? I up am. Uh, I am in Montjuic. Uh, however, Dang. I do have a scooter, and I mean, actually, there's a grocery store right here. Mm-hmm. But like, yeah, the last grocery store run I did was two weeks ago. Yeah, and I used the opportunity to take my scooter and go to like a big grocery store where I can find everything. Uh-huh. Uh, whereas, I mean, the selection here is pretty good, but for two weeks it's a little bit limited. Yeah. Um, so I try to, <laughs> I kind of make a challenge for myself almost every time. Okay, what's the challenge? I mean, we're we're in an age of of creating self challenges. What's your what's your grocery challenge? Just how much food I can bring back. <laughs> I took the challenge of, I mean, filming myself going on the scooter, but also my classic grocery list. Um, well, I came to the store hungry, which was a problem. And um, also I'm out of everything. So it was a combo of... Uh, quite a few things that went wrong. That's why the that thing is packed to the brim. But we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. It'll be pretty funny at least. Is it and then what's the metric? Is it how long you can go before going again? Or is it quantity or dollars or euros? I mean, I mean you can see the quantity. But then, I, obviously, I try and make the food last. Also, I try and not go through it like uh, through butter. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, yeah, I could definitely tell that this was uh, a really big. Nice. I mean, so this, this was a scooter run. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 And you have, do you have like all your panniers filled up and like backpacks and groceries between your legs? Or how do you fit it all on the scooter? All right. We've made it back. And everything from that uh, cart fit just right. We have a little bit of here, a little bit of here, a little bit of in between the legs, another bag here, some stuff on the back, a backpack obviously, and then actually some, well, you can't see it. But now I need to get off the scooter. So this is kind of similar to like if you owned like a Ferrari or a Porsche and <laughs> you know the, the the only thing you can do is the little boot right up in the front. I mean there's only yeah. so much storage for your groceries, but having a scooter and a Ferrari are virtually the same. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I don't think I am in danger of ever owning a Ferrari, so yeah. I need to make the most of the experience via my scooter. Fair. So I in my time in Europe I never owned a vehicle. Um, I got by with, with, it wasn't even Uber then. I mean, taxis and riding a bike and walking everywhere. Um, obviously there's municipal travel like trains and planes and automobiles. Um, but you know what I always wanted was the three wheeled Ape Pogia. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's a, it's if a scooter and a pickup truck yeah. had a child. <laughs> I want one of these so I mean, you see them mostly in Italy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember one time I saw one of them rolling down a hill while we were climbing uh-huh. with the engine turned off Yeah. and the front wheel like super deflated. I was like, <laughs> first hairpin, man. You're yeah, done. Exactly. <laughs> it's not often you could, you could picture a vehicle that could endo, but, or like, yeah. you know, high yeah. side and do yeah. the flip, but I bet it could. Um, okay. So very good. Let's, uh, I got, I got you for, well, I'm hoping to have you for an hour or so. Feel free to do it. No, no, no worries. No worries. We can extend it now that I'm back with all the groceries. There's no rush. Perfect. Um, let's, let's take the first portion and talk about your career. Now you're, you're every, every cyclist favorite Latvian 
because I don't <laughs> think we know a whole ton of Latvians in the first place. You're, you're known for your potato loving. Um, you became a fan favorite, I believe, for, for most people and hit folks' radar at Tour California. Uh, I think Tour California has largely been good for you. You have, you got three wins there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yep. This is this is also Tom Scoyne's wearer of the KOM jersey in the 2019, 2018. I don't know. You you wore a KOM jersey at the Tour de France. Oh yeah, at the Tour. Yeah, I thought I thought we were still in California. Yeah, at the Tour, I wore it in 2018. Yep. Okay. So I think both California and Tour de France are good places to to uh, have have received fan support. Tell me, like, what are give me your highlights? What are, what are, what have been highlights of your like? We're going Quentin Tarantino esque. What have been outstanding highlights of your cycling career? Well, I mean, California is definitely on there. Like, uh, and I I mean, all those three wins were really great. But the first win was a little bit more special just because, for one, I got also the leader's jersey. Mm -hmm. But also, I was on a Devo team, so to say. Mm -hmm. I was on a continental team. And uh, it was uh, it was just more special because it was with the team, a uh, small team, with all the sponsors there. And it was just very, very big for us. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, of course, as you said, uh, the KOM jersey at the tour was a huge deal as well. Mm -hmm. But if we look a little bit further back, then um, I'm really proud of uh, the year of 2013 when I was fifth at Worlds in under 23s, uh, third at European Championships in under 23s, mm -hmm. and uh, also top 10 in Tour de Lavenir, which is a fairly good race for the young kids. Yeah. No kidding. Um, and then how about Bose? Like, and, and not to gloss over these things that you've done, because that stage that you won Tour of California, the first one, 2015, I was on... Oh, uh, no, never mind. I saw that Sagan was second. I was going to say that I, I was working for Sagan. We were no longer teammates. That stage <laughs> was ridiculous, and you won by a minute and change. Yeah, total hats off to that. And then jumping to the other point, you won Tour of Bose, which is like, you know, arguably... North America's hardest stage race. Um, we picked some good ones to win. Yeah, Tour de Bose was also super cool because uh, you're, we were staying with the team. Actually, we were staying in uh, the dormitories. Mm -hmm. uh, and like the director was cooking for us most days or this one year. And uh, it was just like a really cool race to do with the team I was there because we were all like just happy to be there and we were all friends. and. Uh, we didn't really know what to expect, but, uh, yeah, won, uh, the GC and there was actually just one Jersey. I didn't win. It was the <laughs> KOM Jersey that I was second. That was, that's that's every, generous every, way to give that up. <laughs> every other Jersey I won because I was still, uh, still, uh, competing also for the young rider and, okay. uh, the spring Jersey we took on the final day as well. Sheesh. Um, and then you get to wear a special jersey because you are often a national champion. How many, how many Latvian national championships do you have? I actually only have two. One oh, in the man. TT and one in the road race. So okay. this year, I actually am pretty fortunate now that uh, the uh, championship, national championships will be only end of August. I get to keep it for like two extra months. Nice. That ain't bad. Well, shoot. Yeah. I think... There are there are races being scheduled in the future, and we we anticipate there will be racing in 2020. Who knows? I was wondering what happens if you are uh, your teammate, world champion Mads Peterson. Like he could theoretically be world champion for two years. Yeah, I mean, for sure, no one like everyone is planning on racing, mm -hmm. and in my mind, it makes sense that I mean we will be able to race in August and September because especially in Europe, it's been one month in lockdown and yep. there's improvement already. There's more people coming out of the hospitals than uh, getting sick. Okay. Um, and it's been only one month and August, well, it's like July is more than two months away. Right. So August is three, September is four. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be kind of interesting if worlds didn't happen yeah. and that's get, got, got to wear like the jersey also next year. 
he's, yeah, I mean, what a super cool win. It was sort of an opportunist win. He was, you know, especially going into the finale when he's going up against Trentine. I think everybody had assumed Trentine was going to pump him in the sprint. Um, and yeah, it's super cool to see a, a really strong rider who is young and still in sort of a domestique phase of his career to like go fetch water bottles in the world champ jersey. Um, which is not the point that I want to get to. Let's, there's sort of two things. I mean, we can continue on the track of life, but now I also want to, I want to jump around to like what is happening with, with the lockdown. Where were you when, you, when, when things first started to, to be locked down and races started to change? Were you doing Perry Nice or Torino? I was on the plan for Torino, uh, but I was in Girona. I had skipped uh, one weekend of racing because I actually got sick myself. Uh, mm-hmm. I was like proper sick for the first time in my whole career. Um, and uh, then, yeah, I was not going to go to Strada. So I'm hoping the Strada still happens, which means that <laughs> I'm not missing out uh, because I really like that race. And it would be like very fortunate for me. Uh-huh. But yeah, I was in Girona and then the Italian block because I was supposed to do Strada, Torino, uh, maybe San Remo. Uh-huh. Um, that got canceled pretty quick. And uh, then not that long after, we were uh, told to just stay inside and uh, not do much else. And it's such a cataclysmic change to to not just say, okay, like, okay, well, this race will be canceled and this race will be canceled, but like to affect your life and say, go stay inside. I mean, I think Spain, where Girona is, had some pretty strict lockdown orders straight away. Um, how are they enforcing it? How are you being told what, what the rules are? Yeah, I mean, um, the team actually is keeping everyone like informed on what are the rules and what are the do's and don'ts. Mm-hmm. Plus, I have local friends that keep me informed on how it's going and what's going on and what to expect and what not to expect. Mm-hmm. But uh, it definitely was kind of weird for to go from, yeah, you can just keep training and probably race like i mean maybe next week or the week after Mm -hmm. so like yeah you can only go to the grocery store you can only go to the pharmacy you can only go to the bakery and the rest is like inside even like in theory our apartment building that i live in has like a garden that's fenced around it yeah and we're not allowed to go in it because that's a communal space wow so i mean we're talking serious lockdown uh, I think Spain was one of the first to say that no matter who you are, you can't go out and train. Like no professional athletes could go train. Um, yeah. And when you say you're, you're getting news from local friends, is this because largely the news coming in would be in Catalan? How's your Catalan? My Catalan is almost non-existent. How's your Spanish? Spanish pretty good. Okay. Well, not pretty. Actually, not pretty good, but I can get by. I mean, I can have a conversation but if I was watching the news, I would have to like guess maybe part of it. Sure. Um, but I mean, I would understand what's going on and I would understand what is, especially nowadays, you can Google Translate every single web page. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there are some rules that are super strict and I'm not 100% sure on why they're there. For example, at one point they were considering, only in Catalonia though, to Every time you have you go out, you have to print a piece of paper and sign it yourself and like write where you're going, what time you're going, and why you're going there. And then if the police stop you, they can ask for it. And the police have been like checking uh, your grocery store receipts so that you're not walking around groceries just in the middle of nowhere that you bought like five days ago because that's what people do apparently. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, I think they also... I mean, I've never had any troubles. I've seen police all over the place. Well, not all over the place, but I've seen police and they've, they've obviously seen me because there's not that many people on the streets. Yeah. But I've never been stopped. So I guess I, uh, I'm lucky that I don't look suspicious. And how about, I mean, it, it, to our uninformed listener and viewer, um, Girona is such a cycling hotbed. It's basically you live in Girona, you live in Nice, Monaco, or or Luca, and Luca's smaller than the rest. I think Girona per capita has more pro cyclists than anywhere else. How are you? Are you in a lot of communication? Do you do you WhatsApp? Do you chat? Do you just hunker down and say, "See you guys in three more months when we're out of this"? 
Are, are you communicating with a lot of your teammates and friends and folks around town? Yeah, we are communicating and just like because a lot of people are in the same situation where their Spanish or Catalan is not amazing. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to help out the people that don't have a friend that knows what's going on. Sure. Um, and just like there obviously is every time there's a new rule, you might like not realize that it's there. Um, and then someone's like, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. Like any good stories of that? Like so-and-so from New Zealand who doesn't speak a lick of the language and got arrested or anything? I think the biggest surprise was, uh, the first day that uh-huh. the lockdown started because they announced, they announced it was going to start on Monday and Sunday we were riding as per normal. Me, uh, one Finnish guy and, uh, one of his buddy, one of his teammates. Um, and we did like a five hour ride. It was amazing. We went to a lot and, uh, people there were just like, like walking around town, like nothing's happening. Yeah. And Jordan was a bit more quiet. Um, and then we started hearing that people like other cyclists are being stopped by the cops and like told that you could get a fine. Mm-hmm. for this and just sent home and we saw nobody it was great because for one there was very little cars, cars on the road mm-hmm. but for two we saw no one and i mean we were not on big roads we were on small roads so that obviously helped us avoid but it turned out we even didn't know that the lockdown actually had started on sunday yeah <laughs> they just they just changed it they announced it on month that's going to be on monday and then suddenly they were like nah just sunday well, on one hand, that's very European to just be like, eh, let's do it on a different day. On the other hand, you know, coming from the United States where we are, we, you know, fast action, you can do anything at any time of the day. Like you're in Europe and everything shuts down on Sunday. So it's almost like a miracle that they were able to just say, all right, we're going to segue the siesta into lockdown. How's, uh, how is, so how is your training? How is your, how is your motivation? knowing that races continually are being pushed back further and further, like you lay down a thick base and then you got to start racing and then pull on the e-brake. What's your training like? Yeah. Well, I, just because I was sick, uh, for a while there, like I had to take pretty much a week off. Um, I was still kind of motivated to train a little bit. And, uh, I knew that if I go into the lockdown with, uh, like, higher fitness then i can come out of it and get back to it a bit higher mm-hmm. so actually the first two weeks of lockdown i was training pretty solid uh, probably people will call me crazy because i did uh one week of more than 29 hours this uh, is on the trainer well one and a half was gym because i have a semi gym in my garage yeah um so 28 hours on the trainer um, <laughs> okay. but you know what I realized actually on the trainer, you can sometimes do real quality workouts. Tim um, Johnson taught me that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, then I shut it down for a bit and now I'm slowly getting back to it. And hopefully if not next week, then the week after the sky is going to be blue and we're going to be riding outside. Hopefully that'd be sweet. So we're a month in. You're a month in. Is that right? It's a month of lockdown yep. so far. Yeah. Um, give me like what are your what are your distractions? What do you do for 28 hours on the trainer? Do you stare at a blank wall? Do you play the Zwift? Do you double up and do double sessions? You watching movies? I definitely have done a few double sessions. Uh, two hours in the morning and two and a half in the evening. Mm-hmm. I also have done like a f- five hour ride just from the get go. Mm-hmm. However, with obviously getting off the bike and changing my pants halfway through <laughs> because you're just soaked. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, but yeah, I definitely get on Zwift a lot. And I started um, in the last like two weeks, I started uh, chasing some badges and chasing some uh, accomplishments there because I mean, why not? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I also do spend a lot of time watching some YouTube videos. Uh-huh. Just because you can go on a Macklemore downtown video and then just it just keeps playing and you 
the time passes by a lot quicker. That's yeah, for sure. Uh, how about like what's your best COVID distraction, independent of training? Is there something that you find yourself doing, whether it's reading a book, a particular YouTube video, a particular podcast, taking a nap? Like when you are in a a place that that you really need to zen out, how do you how do you pass the time right now? I've been fortunate enough that I've actually have found things to do, yeah. uh, especially because I am alone in my apartment mm-hmm. <laughs> and it would get uh, old pretty quick. Yeah. But yeah, things like, uh, things like I've done a bunch of things like this where we do a Q&A or I've jumped on a podcast of a friend or something. Uh-huh. Um, I also have been reading, obviously. I've, I'm now reading Sapiens a book that a friend brought me and I hadn't actually read it. Um, nice. It's a, it's a good read. And then, uh, yeah, I watched uh, the three documentaries on wine, the Psalm documentaries. Uh, is the Netflix one, like the original one was Psalm? Yeah. Well, it's not on Netflix here. Okay. I watched it on Hulu, uh-huh. but maybe in the US it's on Netflix. Um. Yeah, it might be on this side or the other. The original one is, yeah, I've seen episode one or part one. Great series. To all you wine yeah. nerds, check that one out. Even if you don't like wine, it's a good one. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was just, uh, it was just surprising how uh, competitive and hard it is and how people really, really work for that. Mm-hmm. And uh, just learn, I mean, after that, I realized how people get into wine with all the history and all the different years and all the different things that you actually need to learn and know. And I mean, yeah, it's uh, it, not just the tasting part of it is interesting because I mean, someone can be just shit at tasting because they can never like figure out their taste buds. But uh, just the hit, like just the other parts are really interesting as well. Yeah, I think it's in the first one where they. They're they're hitting a a handful of quick interviews and it's like pillars of state and doctors and and brain surgeons and they're like hands down hardest thing I ever did was become a master sommelier and like respect. Furthermore, yeah. It, yeah, I think I feel like people are super tasters. Like you either have something or you don't have it, and certainly you can train what you're what you're able to taste. But man, that yeah, eye opening video, folks, go watch Saw. Um, so yeah, speaking of you being all lonely right there in Girona in your apartment, you are engaged to be married. Congratulations. Thank um, you. Your, your fiance is in Colorado. Is that right? Yep. Abby Mickey, former pro cyclist hanging out in Colorado. How, how has that decision gone about where to be, how to travel, what, how you're going to pass this time together or apart. How'd that all unfold? I mean, so obviously it was not uh, an easy situation to be in. She was supposed to come uh, over mid-March. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much when the stuff really started happening and serious lockdowns started happening. And people realized how just like really bad this might get. And, um, so her flight got canceled. Uh, and then we really didn't want to risk getting her a new flight because, um, if suddenly she comes over, but then for whatever reason, she has to go back to help family or whatever, Mm -hmm. it would be a really hard situation to be in. Um, and obviously traveling right now or even well for the last month and a half, has been super risky as well, just with getting stuck somewhere yeah. or suddenly some country realizing, yeah, we don't, we want to close our borders. So screw you guys. Um, and obviously I cannot go to the States because uh, Trump said no Europeans allowed. We made one of these episodes kind of political um, and and that was not appreciated. Not to say that anything we've just said is political. Um, yeah, that was pretty wild when he said no euros allowed. Um, I don't know. It seems to be an ever evolving Trump saying something and then a day later it being corrected. 
Um, but shoot, yeah, that's a, that's a serious place to be, especially as a engaged couple. Yeah, I mean, for one, what uh, we both didn't realize was also when the White House announced uh, that uh, like restrictions on Europeans arriving. Mm-hmm. In the beginning, they said they were saying like, "Oh, thirty days," but it turns out they were like, "Probably thirty days," but it actually is until they lift the restriction. So yeah. even though it has been more than a month right now, I still uh, am stuck here. Which is nuts. And so like to continue to jump around on, on topics, there are races that are being forecasted both in the States, in Europe, throughout the world at a further date. And certainly you can, you can take estimates and, and the officials can say, okay, we're going to have this on this particular date. I feel, I feel personally, it's kind of like throwing a dart at a, at a wall in a dark room to say that this is going to be the correct date. Do yeah, you, I mean, yeah, I I agree a little bit with that. Um, you never like not no dates are certain, no dates are set in stone. But just because I saw, see how like even in Europe now, there there's several countries that are lifting some restrictions at least, mm-hmm. and Spain also has lifted some restrictions that were in place before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not for no reason. It's because the dump numbers are going down. More people are leaving the hospital than people testing positive, which is a huge deal. Um, and we're only a month in. And as I said, it's like more than two months till July. Mm-hmm. So I, normally, if you if you can plan anything, you would think that by that time, uh, we should be good to go, but at the same time, yeah, we might uh, we might come out, we might spend two weeks in fresh air, and then it might happen again, and we might be stuck indoors again for two months. So yeah, all right. So it's fingers crossed that everything is going to unfold in this in this particular timeline. You seem, given this conversation, and just knowing you in general, that you 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 exude a a sense of positivity. So like. Hopefully things go on as as per usual, and we'll have a season in 2020. How do you how would you react if there was no season whatsoever, and we don't do anything until 2021? Is that okay? Is that annoying as hell? I mean, I would be really sad and probably frustrated. Mm-hmm. Well, not really frustrated because it's not like I can do anything about it, nor it's not like it would happen for no reason. It would probably be a pretty significant reason why it's not happening. Uh, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, obviously it would not, uh, it would just be sad. I, I really am hopeful that it opens up and for not, not, not for, for several reasons, but one of them being because it would be kind of cool to like have the Giro in October. Yeah. Have, or no, I guess, uh, yeah, in October, have the Welta in November and mm-hmm. have all these races not in place they're supposed to be and be racing like nonstop every weekend, every week for three months, four months, because that's never going to happen again, you know? Right, right. Like Milan and Remo is never not going to be in March. And those, And it's not just one race, it's just that everything is like in this situation where anything can happen. No one knows what to expect because now pro cycling has gotten into this rhythm where it's like, all right, well, now I go to Dauphiné, then I do altitude, then I do tour, then I take rest, then I do this, then I do that race. And so many guys are on the same schedule year by year. Yeah. So I actually think it would be super, super refreshing to have something just like out of the ordinary thrown into like just chaos. I'm totally with you. Um, with the quick aside, it, the the only one downside would be if a big race like the Tour de France, if it lands on a previously scheduled race, obviously all eyes are on the Tour de France and less so the other races. But it sort of speaks to how big cycling in it is and how how many races there are on a calendar, which to the average cycling fan, it's way too many. Like they haven't heard of yeah. 98% of races that are out there. Um, that said, I think... This this also speaks to my lack of cycling history. The Giro and Tour used to be super close together, and the, I think the Vuelta too. They reached like 
something foolish, like a week apart. Um, and so, yeah, as you say, like MSR, Milan San Remo is always going to be in March. Unless we find that, oh, you know what? It's super cool to have it way later in the year. So like, it would be funny to see how this could affect things down the road. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? How about... Um, you are a, a global traveler. You are a, a uh, linguist, I presume, since you're speaking with me in English and not Latvian. What is, what is upbringing like in Latvia? What was, what's your family like? Um, go way back. How'd you, how'd you get into cycling? So um, I had two older sisters, both of whom actually don't live in Latvia anymore. Mm-hmm. One of Where them lives... At? Uh, in the UK and one of them lives in Brussels. Uh, my parents are still back home and uh, whenever I go back, obviously I stay with uh, my mom because the only reason I go back is to see her. Nice. Uh, and obviously see my dad, see my grandpa. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, I grew up in a pretty small town of like, I think when I was growing up, it was like 5,000 people maybe. Uh-huh. And uh, so, I mean, small town on the coast, uh, not too far from the beach. So we were always outside. We were always doing random outdoor activities as uh, kids. And um, then at one point when I was 14, just on the age of 15, one of my sister's boyfriend at the time took me uh, to a mountain bike race. And then uh, I was like, oh, that was kind of cool. I'll do that again next weekend. Mm-hmm. And uh, soon after, yeah, I started training in a club. In Latvia, you have um, more of a club scene where all the kids are followed by one coach that always follows with a car behind you. And you train in mm-hmm. like a group of tw- 10 to 20 sometimes. Oh. Um, and yeah, you just uh, ride around and the coach makes sure that everyone does their exercises. So it's a lot of team time trial stuff. Uh, some hill repeats here and there, some sprints uh, when safe. And uh, yeah, you you end up doing a lot of the same roads because, I mean, there's not that many roads in Latvia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's very, very flat, but uh, it's uh, it's a good fun. Is it, how's the, the bicyclist-motorist relationship? I mean, if you have groups of 20 out with a car behind, it's, it's, it's very European to our American audience that would result in a whole lot of angry motorists and honking horns. Is it totally normal to see groups like that? Definitely not super normal, but there's more and more cyclists every year, every year, be that cyclists that ride to do a race, but also cyclists just out on the streets Mm -hmm. uh, to use it as a mode of transport. And uh, the motorists have become more just paying more attention to us. And uh, I've never had bad interactions with people on the road, even if we're riding two abreast, just the two of us. Um, obviously, there's every once in a while, there's someone that is not happy, uh, but he probably is not happy about something else. Yeah, <laughs> well said. And how about you and I were, were chatting a while ago and you were excited that you're getting married in Latvia, which... Should everything work out as planned, I think even with the new schedule, then you can keep your original wedding date. Tell me about a Latvian wedding because it sounds like a rager and I really want to go. <laughs> That's not trying to get invited to your wedding. <laughs> Latvian culture in general has a lot of um, symbolism in it. Uh, we are pretty much pagans. So a lot of our traditions are super, super pagan. Uh-huh. Um, and, um, yeah, Latvian wedding is at least 24 hours usually. Uh, sometimes it's two days, uh, like two full days. And, um, the classic scenario would be that you start with, uh, bought, like going to where the bride is and buying her out sort of by buying her out. It, uh, usually is some tasks that the family comes up with that you have to do in order to prove that you're worthy. Uh Um, And then the normal classic ceremony happens. Give me an example. What kind of thing are you worthy of? Like winning Uh, a bike race or felling a tree? 
doing some like chop some wood for example okay. Far out. or like i uh, made my sister's husband to be at the time uh open a beer bottle with just a piece of paper and not like a screw top beer bottle that you guys have but like yeah like one you have to actually use an open wow. for. what a legend uh, that's totally worthy and, of yeah exactly material. so i mean Depending on what the family is like, the, these are the traditions. Uh-huh. And then obviously the normal ceremony after which usually it usually happens around, uh, let's say, two, three o'clock. And then the couple along with their sort of God couple, because we don't really have bridesmaids and groomsmen. Mm-hmm. We have a couple that is responsible that helps you out with the wedding and stuff but also they are the god couple as in they would be the ones you turn to in order to like talk about relationships or like say you have some problems down the line or just for advice or whatever whatever yeah uh, and with them you go for like two three hours you're taking pictures but also you're kind of proving also um again proving that you belong as a couple. Uh-huh. Um, and during this, there's some traditional things that you do, like uh, you have to carry the bride across a bridge. Um, you, a lot of times you take one of those, you probably in Europe, everyone's seen like people, a lot of bridges have locks with like dates or names or whatever. Yeah. A lot of times you do that. Um, and then... Uh, so you're drive while you're driving around. This is very interesting. While you're driving around uh, in a car, usually the car is a little bit decorated, so everyone can see what's going on. Yeah. And people that are not in the wedding, also people that are, are in the wedding, but people that are not in the wedding, people you don't know, uh, just random people on the street, they can stop you and make a gate, sorta. Uh, which you have, to, uh, it can be anything. It can be them lying on the s- floor, uh, on the street. It can be like made out of something. Like they can just put like branches suddenly on the road. I mean, it can be anything. Uh-huh. Um, and then in order to get through the gate, usually you have to bribe them or they make you do something. <laughs> so whenever yeah. you're like driving around, you have quite a few liquor bottles in the car. Uh-huh. because you probably <laughs> will need them. Making better and better decisions throughout the day. No. Um, okay. And then, uh, yeah, you come back, uh, you have dinner usually, and then around midnight is the classic Latvian ceremony. That, like the traditional Latvian ceremony that's, you always have a big bonfire going. Um and uh, there's again a bunch of rituals, a bunch of like symbolism in it. Um, and then you pretty much dance to like 6 a.m. or so. In my sister's wedding, I think the band was playing to like four or five. Wow. And then the DJ to like six or seven. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you wake up at nine. Also, a traditional is to go wake up the newlyweds uh-huh. uh, in some sort of fashion and uh, that sounds, yeah, well, sounds dangerous <laughs> if, they're, if they're not sleeping for example yeah um well that's part of the yeah. fun hence the liquor it's okay. part, it is part of the fun um and then the next morning people are so everyone actually sleeps um like right there so when you're booking a place you're booking a place that has bedrooms for everyone yeah be that like you could do it obviously in a hotel or a guest house or like we have a lot of um, old mills that have been turned into like places that people have weddings or just parties (laughs) Uh, and then so everyone sleep has been sleeping there everyone wakes up nine ten whatever and then uh, you still have breakfast you pretty much start dancing again (laughs) usually (laughs) Uh, and then, yeah, I think at my sister's wedding, people started leaving at like two o'clock or something. Yeah. So yes. would you ever do like a full other day of party? When you say it's two days of partying, I see how this could be one day segueing into the next. Are there like mega ragers that go 
Yeah, it's that it's more um, more common in uh, a Russian culture. Okay, but obviously, Latvian culture is very much influenced by Russians, uh, and so definitely a lot of time. Well, not it doesn't really go into another day because usually you book the place for just one night. Sure. Uh, but p- people are there out there that book straight away two nights and uh, just plan on being there for another day. So do you, have you ever been to an American wedding? Do you find them extremely boring? I do. I okay. have and I do. You're yeah. like, I brought my sleeping bag. I'm here for a party. <laughs> I'm ready for tomorrow. <laughs> Why is everybody going home? Well, that's awesome. How many folks? Uh, how many folks do you do you plan on having at your wedding? Are they enormous affairs? The whole town's invited. Uh, we're probably going to have between sixty and a hundred. Okay, that's a good number. I think we had sixty in ours. Ours was merely within a few hours, but <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna have a blast. That's super cool. Um, yeah. How I preface this by saying that the, the potentially new race schedule is not going to conflict currently. What is not to tell the world when you're getting married, but let's tell the world when you're getting married. What's your your date? Actually, so this is the reason, I mean, when they first said that the tour is going to be postponed, it would have clashed with the wedding because the wedding is August 3rd. Okay. But we also were smart enough or now the tour is even later. So it's not a problem, but we also were smart enough to not put it on a weekend because there's always a race on the weekend. And just because you have cyclist friends, you know that someone's not going to make it if it's on a weekend. That's so we actually brilliant. put it in the week, which is also cheaper. Uh-huh. So it's a win-win. I love it. Well, I know exactly when that is. That sounds like a Monday because our event, Rooted Vermont, we have a gravel event. I don't know if you've heard of gravel. It's a big thing. <laughs> we, have a, we have a cycling event. Um, how, how about... I have an infatuation with maple syrup and I love maple syrup and you are known for your fondness for potatoes. Um, so much so that once upon a time I got, I got pinged by the Vermont, I mean not Vermont, by the U S potato association. And like, would you like to promote potatoes? And they're like, yeah, maybe, but you know, Tom's is the guy <laughs> who should really be doing it. Where did your fondness for potatoes come from? Well, Potatoes are just something that is a staple in Latvian cuisine. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of jokes about Latvians and potatoes, how a sack of potatoes is worth more than a gold. gold, And a sack of potatoes feeds uh, a family of 20 for a month and so on and so forth. Uh, There's a lot of jokes and they're really good actually. Uh, but also when you're on Hinkapi, Brian, he started making fun of me and I started defending potatoes because uh-huh. they are amazing. Uh-huh. You can pretty much, I mean, it's like other vegetables that are not trying. You can make so many things out of potatoes and plus not only you can eat them, but did you know you can actually light a light bulb with potatoes? <laughs> uh, I did not know that.
it's I love what you said how how other vegetables aren't trying like art projects when you're a kid in the states often you work on cutting out a shape you have half a potato and then you cut out a shape and then you dip it in ink and you have this you have this stamp mm. made out of potatoes yeah it's a pasta you can make gnocchi out of it man yeah. fries chips yeah mash wow vodka. scalloped vodka I like I like what you're saying here. Um, you have a you have a go to potato recipe. What's what's just an easy go to? Uh, I do definitely eat more sweet potatoes than anything, mm-hmm. um, and then a lot of times I would use them to I would bake them, uh-huh. and then actually I've used them to make waffles. After you bake a bunch of sweet potatoes, well, for sure you eat one or two, but then. Uh, like there's always leftovers and you can make them in waffles. You can make them in like oat bars. Um, I've actually done that a few times and that's really, I mean, it's really nice. I mean, yeah, you can do just so many things. I love it. Um, are you familiar with a Japanese or Asian sweet potato? Yes. Oh man, that thing is so good to our, our uninformed listener, go to the grocery store and either buy a Japanese or Asian sweet potato. All you got to do is bake them, maybe a little olive oil, salt and pepper, and they're just so sweet and rich. And yeah, like I'm, I'm with you. I love sweet potatoes more than, than your average potato, but that's just the ticket. Yeah. Uh, how much of your grocery shopping today in your Ferrari scooter was occupied by potatoes? Uh, raw potatoes are probably like two kilos or two. Okay. Uh, yeah, more or less. Uh, but then we have other forms of potatoes there also. All right. I love it. Well done. Well done. Um, well, I dig it. What's, uh, I, I think I've hit all of my 19 questions that I was going to ask. So the, the COVID-19 questions have now reached their, their, their zenith. Um, man. I wish you nothing but success through the rest of your season. I wish you nothing but patience as you get through your 30 hour indoor weeks. Um, <laughs> I, I greatly appreciate the time. Oh, my pleasure. Um, it means a lot. So cool. Well, folks, thanks for paying attention. Thank you, Toms. We will, we will be watching you on the telly. Have a good Thank you, season. Good. Right on, man. See ya. See ya.